Hey, good evening, everybody. Thank you all for um, sharing with me your most precious asset, and that's your time. And um, I really am appreciative of these chances to share with you. And all I'm doing is um, going to share with you my clinical experience. So I've been in practice over 30 years. I have gone through a lot of different things. Uh, I got my master's with the AGD. I went through the Academy of Cosmetic Dentistry accreditation and all kinds of other stuff. But, you know, um, none of that matters as much as doing things that my patient likes. And if the patient likes it, then I'm a success. It doesn't matter what else I've achieved, really. The patients really just know if it looks good, if it hurt, and how much it costs, kind of. So what we're talking about tonight is the very, very basics of dentistry, just the simple but the backbone to most of our restorative practices. And that is the simple, predictable um, class five lesion. And there's not much to it. I know some of you have great success with them and others do class five lesions and they seem to pop off all the time. So we're gonna talk about it a little bit and uh, I'm gonna go through some cases with you and, um, and then we'll get started on some hands-on stuff. And I'm gonna go over the hands-on kit in just a minute and all that, but I've gotta go over a little bit of background. So we'll do a few cases here real quick. First of all, I wanna thank Shofu for sponsoring this and Catapult Education. I am very fortunate that I've worked with almost all the manufacturers out there. I've been lucky enough to been asked to speak by um, different ones. Um, at this point in my career, I only speak for those companies that I have used every day in practice, and that is the truth. So I've been fortunate enough to become selective in who I work with, and um, I mean that sincerely. At this point, it doesn't have much to do with money or anything like that. It has to do with my honor. And so, again, thank you very much for being here. Catapult Education is a wonderful source of education. Um, I know you know about it because you're joining this uh, webinar, um, but they have many, many great speakers and just a great, great source of, uh, of um, experience and a wealth of knowledge. And so if you get a chance, check out some of the other videos and webinars that they have going on for them. So tonight, restoring. We're talking about abstractions made simple. And it says a three-step approach with optimal outcomes. Well, I don't know. I've never done a perfect filling. I've never done a perfect cosmetic case. I've never done anything perfect, but I will tell you that I try as hard as I can on every single restoration on every single patient. You have to understand, and if you've been in practice long enough, you know this, you can only work um, as well as your environment and the, the patient and that particular case allows. In other words, you have to accept the fact that there's nothing perfect in dentistry. But what we can do is we can give it our all. And uh, we don't have to use that much um, energy and it doesn't take that much effort, really. It just takes a system, that's all. So the goal for tonight um, is to talk about class five abstractions with these goals in mind for me, myself. If I was having some abstraction lesions done on myself or my family, this is what I would want. Limited tooth removal. I'd like you to drill as little as possible. And a lot of times you don't have to drill any. Number two, I want it to be aesthetic. So with my background in aesthetic dentistry, um, obviously we, um, we focus on, uh, patients don't want ugly anymore. They want something that looks like a tooth and functions like a tooth. The third one is where some of you have some issues and that is, is that the clinical success. We are confident in getting over 90% success for five years. Now notice, I'm not gonna tell you tonight that everything's perfect and none of them ever come off. I'm not saying that at all, but what I will tell you is that the vast majority of patients have no issues with them, whether it's micro leakage or uh, recurrent decay or uh, loss to restoration. Um, within five years, and most of them many, many more years than that. This is a, that what we're going to talk about tonight are things that we've been doing well over 15 years, and so um, there's nothing new. But now I'm going to tell you, we can't cover everything in a short webinar like this. Let's go over some stuff that we're not going to cover. Um, occlusion. But I want you to know, you've got to understand that the mouth is an um, interactive thing, 
teeth are interactive with gums and that's interactive with muscles and that's interactive with soft tissue. And there's all kinds of things working together. And I'm going to tell you, um, I do teach with the Pacific Aesthetic Continuum. I'm one of the clinical directors there and we talk about occlusion and um, I'm not going over occlusion tonight, but you have to understand that if you're talking about a pure abfraction case, it is occlusally related. So I'll just stop with that. Most cases that we see a lot of abfractions like this, not only do they get the restorative stuff that we're gonna talk about, they, they usually get one or some of these things. They get a bruxism splint, equilibration, or bonding on the cuspids. And what I mean by that is we'll put some, in this case, you see that the cuspid on that screen is worn. And that tells me that there's something parafunctional going on. So if we're gonna do some infractional lesions in this case, almost always I'll recommend a four surface composite on six and 11 or on 22 and 27 and restore those cusp tips because we want canine, canine rise if we can. Here's some other things we're not gonna cover tonight. Elon Musk and Twitter. I don't know how you feel about all this stuff. I, you know, um, uh, I was going to make an offer for Twitter, but I didn't have uh, however many $40 billion lying around, um, at least not this evening. Uh, so um, I did not make an offer, but Elon Musk, I, we'll see how this works out, but it's all over the news, right? Something else we're not going to cover. Johnny Depp and Amanda Heard. Now, I don't know how, how um, miserable or how upsetting your life can be at times. Um, but when we look at some of these other people that supposedly are the most successful people in, in, in the world, maybe, um, and they have these issues like they have, well, it makes my life seem a lot better. You know what I'm saying? So sometimes it's about perspective. It's about looking at things the right way. Long, crummy winter this winter. And I am looking at it like, boy, Florida sounds good, but property values, eh, if you're in Florida already, congratulations. Um, for me, boy, we've been looking at, my wife and I have been looking at houses down there for a few years. I can't believe how much they've gone up. What we used to think was expensive is now ridiculously expensive. But anyway, so here in St. Louis kind of looked like that this winter, and that's uh, Bentley, um, my dog. So anyway, so bad winter for now, though, the optimism of spring is here. And uh, after the snow melted, this is what the backyard looked like. I don't know what happened, but some sort of continental drift thing going on. But this is St. Louis, right? Obviously not. Okay, restorative dentistry. All things being equal, if our restor restorative materials can have a positive influence on the oral environment, shouldn't they? Let me say it like this. We've been trying to put fillings and crowns and veneers and all kinds of stuff in patients' mouths for years hoping to not cause damage. In other words, we don't want our restorations to be causing um, uh, ill effects on the gum tissue or systemically. And if you remember the amalgam thing going on years ago, and I'm not knocking amalgams at all, but patients were upset by things that they heard on, on media um, and uh, they got nervous about it. So instead of not just not doing harm, we're striving today to put things in the mouth that actually are a benefit to the patient. And those kind of fillings and materials that we use are called biointeractive, or you know them as bioactive probably, or regenerative restorative materials. And this is all over, and it's what I spend a good deal of my time teaching on. But nevertheless, what we're trying to do is put things in the mouth that make a, a difference in a positive way, not just neutral, and certainly not bad, but can we affect the oral environment so that it is a better place after we do our restorations? And regenerative materials, they're all based on this ionic exchange. Oh, by the way, there is a quiz at the end. And um, let's just say you were asked about how regenerative or biointeractive materials work. Um, and you know, let's just say one of your choices might be ionic exchange. Let's keep that in mind just in case. I don't know, I don't know. But uh, ionic exchange is the materials that we put in the mouth, they give off things that the oral environment are affected by. And ions that come off, like for instance, fluoride or calcium or phosphates, those kinds of things affect the oral environment. They affect it in, a, in several different ways. And we'll talk about those real, real quick. And the, there's a bunch of $5 words, bioactive, biointeractive. 
Oh, boy. I'm sorry about that. That's Bentley, the, the chocolate lab I just uh, showed you. Obviously, my wife's having another Amazon delivery. And um, anyway, um, probably another return tomorrow. But anyway, biointeractive uh, is the word we really focus on today. And that's the ability of a material to release ions that might result in remineralization and to change the pH level in the mouth and maybe to change the um, microbe count in the mouth. So in other words, can our materials give off ions that reduce plaque, reduce bacteria, reduce the chance of secondary decay, reduce the chance of, of uh, sensitivity? There's all kinds of regenerative materials out there that we've been playing with for a long, long time now. A lot of you have used two major regenerative type materials over the years, and that's calcium hydroxide, like DICAL or LIFE, those kind of liners we used years ago. Uh, others of you have used glass ionomers. Glass ionomers give off fluoride and, and they make asthenis feel good because they give off ions that help um, do some of the things we talked about. So that's kind of the direction we're going with things. We're gonna focus on a classification of materials tonight called gyamers. Gyamers is proprietary. It's, it's owned by Show Food. That's the technology they own. Let's supposing that you could take a glass ionomer and make it look as good as a composite, have the um, physical characteristics and the clinical performance of a composite, but has the fluoride release of a glass ionomer and some other ions that help neutralize acid which may decrease the amount of bacteria in the mouth, but again, have the ability to be as aesthetic as about any other material you can use. Also be a great value. And that's what we're gonna talk about tonight. We're gonna to specifically talk about part of that classification of materials, the gymer materials. We're gonna talk about the flowable materials. So I've worked with different um, places that uh, review materials. I worked with Michael Miller in reality many years ago. Um, I've done reviews for Dental Advisor, Dental Product Shopper, and some others. And the best flowable composite by many of the people who evaluate is Beauty Fill. Now, a lot of you have used Beauty Fill before. That's a gymer. Um, and they came out with Beauty Fill Flow Plus. That's very popular material, very great value. Um, now there's Beauty Fill Flow Plus X, a little bit different formula, a little better polishability. And that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. So you can choose, you can just plug holes, you know, you drill a hole and you stick stuff in there and hope it lasts, hope the patient pays, that kind of thing. You know what I'm talking about? Or you can provide therapy and therapeutic restorations have the ability to improve the environment around them. That's what we're talking about. When you look at all the numbers and everything, Beauty Fill stacks up just as well. In fact, better in many of the classifications, any the categories, um, as probably anything you use. So if you can have similar properties clinically, aesthetically, functionally, then why wouldn't you choose materials, especially if they cost the same or even less in a lot of cases, why wouldn't you choose materials that have a positive or a therapeutic effect? And that's what we want. That's what we're looking for. How does it work? Well, they've got a def different type of filler that is not susceptible to the moisture in the mouth. So, you know, glass ionomers, they give off fluoride. Wonderful. And even good looking glass ionomers like Equia from GC and some of the others like that. Um, they look good when we put them in, but they get a little bit pitted on the surface and a little pick up a little stain with time. And they just don't look as good as a lot of our composites look. Now uh, you probably agree with me on that. That's probably not revolutionary. So, but what we can do now is choose materials like the gymers that release the fluoride that glass ionomers do, but have the characteristics to the composites. Let's get going a little quicker. Bioactive, biointeractive materials release ions that do things. Here's a few ions for you given off by the gymers, and I know you focus on fluoride. There's others here that also have an effect on uh, microbes, pH, and remineral remineralization. And so that's what we're talking about. So with the, some of you beauty fill users, beauty fill flow plus has been around for years now. And um, it's a wonderful material. Beautiful flow plus X just has a little smaller filler, um, but otherwise the characteristics are just as wonderful, a little better polish. And that's what we're talking about today. And if you look at the difference for those of you thinking about, well, why should I switch from flow plus? Um, well, that's up to you. It's uh, they handle real similarly. They 
aesthetically very similarly. Uh, but Beautyfill has uh, smaller particles and polish is just a bit better. That's all. Okay. Well, so scientifically for me, like, you know, I'm into this science stuff, right? So I just take a patient bib, I tape it on the wall and I squirt stuff out and I see if it runs or not. And so scientifically, um, I'm just looking to see how it handles because the first thing I have to know as a dentist is how does it feel and look to me? So um, these are ion releasing injectable hybrids. The thing to know about Beautyful Line, there's a low flow, that's the blue stuff, and a no flow, and that's the red label there. So um, the no flow on the right there is the one that's not slumping at all. And the, the low flow moves a little bit, just a little bit, not to say it's runny because it is not runny but it's kind of self-leveling, if you will. And after 30 minutes at 45 degrees, does it maintain its shape? And so you can see a real good idea what the difference is there. Now, personally, I prefer the blue. I like the low flow because I like things to self-level a little bit. Others of you want no movement at all when you squirt it on the tooth. And um, we call these injectable hybrids. They are hybrid composite materials. Some of you think that um, flowables must be uh, weak because there's too much shrinkage and not enough filler and all that. You've got to really kind of get that out of your mind today because of the formulations of many of these flowables that are um, have very similar product properties to your packable hybrids. Um, but there's some ways to use them, some reasons to use them. Um, and we'll talk about that. Beautiful flow plus, like I said, acid neutralization is really important. Does it control acidity? Will it make them last longer? So there's lots of great studies on these now, and you can look those up. Um, University of Florida and a bunch of other places have done some great independent research on these, and it's a wonderful thing to consider. So here we go. When you look at these in the mouth, what do you think? Do you treatment plan these? Do you mention to the patient that they could use a graft? Um, do they need ortho? Do they need equilibrations? Do you think nothing? So generally speaking, I, I have to tell you that dentistry is an honorable profession and I wanna keep it that way. We do not treatment plan for all of these, we don't. But when the patient talks about sensitivity to touch or to toothbrush or sensitivity to cold, or they don't like the color of them or the way they look, then we talk about treatment for them. Now, of course, if they were developing periodontal issues, then we certainly would consider a graft um, and talk to them about that. Um, but my hygienist might mention to them that, hey, you know, Dr. Griffin can put some material on here um, to seal those up a little bit, make them look better and certainly be less sensitive. If you're interested in that, we'll talk about that more later. But if the patient mentions them, certainly we have some solutions. When do we treatment plan them? Sensitive, unsightly, or patients are concerned. And that's when we'll treatment plan or at least start the discussion on these. So what is your go-to treatment here? What, what's your normal treatment here? So a lot of you, you're tempted to take a 33 and a half or a number two round burr and start cutting retention grooves all over the place. You'll cut a groove under the enamel. You'll cut a groove down at the gum line you're trying to lock them on because you know that as the tooth flexes, which is what causes these to begin with in most cases, when the tooth flexes that the material that you put on there, the composite doesn't flex. And when the tooth flexes, but the composite doesn't, bad things happen like the marginal integrity disappears and sometimes they pop off. And so as the patient grinds and clenches, moves their teeth around and chews, um, the tooth flexes, the material pops off and we get aggravated with that. So you're tempted to drill a whole bunch of holes and things just to hold them on. In fact, a lot of you will take a burr and you'll drill away more dentin than what's already missing before you started. And I know because at our hands-on courses, we see that once in a while. I'm just saying you, you and I, I know you care. Um, so we just want to be as conservative as possible, but still get a great result. My goal, again, limited tooth removal, aesthetic, over 90% success for five years. So here we go. First thing we're going to do, I'm going to give you for a list of 14 things here. I know it sounds like a lot, but it's not because this is the very simple things that we consider that we don't even consider and we just routinely do them. They're in this list. 
First thing is you're going to bevel the enamel. Now, I, in this course description, it says you may not even have to drill. That's true. There are other ways to place a bevel, and I'll go over that in just a second. Most of the time, or many times, we can do this without even numbing the patient. How do you know? Well, we let the patient know that um, we're going to be rinsing the tooth a couple of times. We don't have to drill much on the tooth, but we've got to clean the surface. And when we say clean the surface, we mean we're going to clean the dentin or the cementum in some way. But you and I have to think about cleaning in the sense of a bevel on the enamel. So the best long-term bond in the history of dentistry is to etched enamel. Whenever we etch enamel, we increase um, the retention, at least in that part of the restoration, of course. But overall, if we can do a long, irregular bevel, and I'll demonstrate that in a little bit, I'll show you what that looks like. Irregular meaning that it is not just a continuous 45 or 30 degree angle going across the enamel. It is long, several millimeters, and irregularly placed. Again, I'll demonstrate that. When we prepare the dentin or the cementum, the best way to do that is with air abrasion. 50 micron aluminum oxide, 27 micron aluminum oxide. It can be a, an air abrasion system like a micro etcher from Danville Engineering. It could be more fancy like a Rondo Flex from Cavo. It could be one of the other units on the market. It doesn't really matter that much. What we're trying to do is to prepare the root surface, which is normally difficult to bond to. We're trying to break that surface tension, get rid of any contaminants on the surface, increase surface area on which to bond to. And that's what we're trying to do because that root surface is hard to bond to, as you know. And that's one of the reasons you start drilling holes in things because you want to increase the retention and hopefully get it to stick. Well, Instead of doing that, let's air abrade. When we air abrade, we blast 45 degrees or so to the tooth surface away from the gums. And the reason we blast away from the gums is so as not to cause bleeding. Now, let's suppose you don't have air abrasion. What's choice two? Well, some of you could use a laser if you had a hard tissue laser. I'm gonna assume if you don't have air abrasion, you probably don't have a hard tissue laser. So the next step we would consider doing is a number two or number four round bar on a slow speed just to roughen or clean the surface. That's all we're talking about doing. The next choice probably would be to just to use some pumice, not profi paste, but pumice to clean that root surface very well. We'll go over that again in just a minute. Now we're gonna etch, we're gonna do selective etch. And that is the best long-term bond in the history of dentistry is to etched enamel. Now. Many of your universal bonding agents, including, including Beauty Bond, which we'll talk about in a few minutes, they are acidic. The universal bonding agents have acidic monomers in them that will etch enamel, especially cut enamel. They don't do very well on uncut enamel, and they don't etch enamel as well as phosphoric acid. Selective etch meaning that we're going to intend to put our etch on just enamel. We're going to rinse it off after 15 seconds. We're going to keep the tooth moist always. We're never going to dry it out. You don't have to dry it to see if your etch turned the enamel frosty. You know it did. You don't have to look at that. And we're going to put our bonding agent on. In this case, we're going to use Beauty Bond. And again, those of you who have kits, I'll go over that in just a few minutes. I'll show you my kit, and then we'll, we'll be using that. Uh, Beauty Bond's a seventh generation universal type bonding agent. It etches cut enamel 30 second application. The instructions tell you you don't have to place etch. And you don't, as long as you are absolutely sure you're getting it on cut enamel. Still though, my preference is to always do selective etch. I don't etch dentin intentionally, but I do etch enamel intentionally. We're gonna air thin the bonding agent well. The reason we air thin well is to get rid of the carriers, the, the acetone, ethanol, the water, whatever is in that bonding agent that allows us to put it on the tube. We wanna get rid of that. We air thin it until it doesn't move anymore, and then the surface should look shiny. Then we're going to light cure it. Now, the first layer that we're going to place is gyromer flowable, that injectable hybrid at the gum line, just at the gingival margin, and then we're going to cure that well. In other words, about a half a millimeter or so layer of gyromer flowable at the gingival cemental margin up, up towards the gums, Seal that margin and you can put a little bit on all of the dentin if you want, half a millimeter or so layer, not on the enamel yet, 
just on the cementum or dentin. That's it. And then light cure it. Now, what's the deal with that? The reason that we are doing that is we want to control the polymerization shrinkage stresses. So as we cure our materials, there is shrinkage involved. And there has been my one of my mentors, Paul Belvedere, talked about it for many, many years, way before I thought about it. Um, and they talked about polymerization shrinkage stresses. So which way does the composite shrink towards? And um, how can you cure it to help reduce the shrinkage stresses? Well, let's just, so that there's no argument tonight, let's just seal that gingival margin and the dentin first, cure it well, then do the rest of your dentin buildup, two millimeter increments, cure. And then the last part we're gonna do is cover all of that enamel up. Um, and the reason is, is we're controlling our shrinkage first where the margins are most likely to fail in this type of restoration, and that's the cementum or gingival margin. There's another reason to seal up that gingival margin first, and the reason is, is very simple, and it's time. The longer my patient sits there before I seal that margin, the more likely there is for gingival fluid, curricular leakage, to get up and contaminate that margin after I have my bonding agent on. So in other words, it's a speed thing. We just want to seal that up as soon as possible. So we're trying to work quick here. And we're going to fill it up in two millimeter increments. The tooth we're going to work on tonight takes about two or three layers, if you will, just with an injectable hybrid. Some of you ask, well, shouldn't I be using a stronger, more whatever stronger means, more durable composite, like a packable hybrid on these? And the answer is yes, if they're very large, but for tonight's restoration, a small lab fraction area, we use 100% injectable hybrid. Why is that? Well, if your material is very hard, in other words, after it is cured, if it has a very rigid nature and doesn't flex, then it can't flex with the tooth. So as the patient grinds and clenches, the very reasons these ab fraction lesions formed, if you put something on there that is way stiffer than the tooth, then it can't flex with the tooth. And that's one of the reasons behind the injectable hybrid idea with doing these res restorations. We get flexure that is more comparable to the tooth than with a packable hybrid. Then we're gonna shape and polish and do our thing. We're gonna use some super snaps uh, later as we go. What we're trying to do is have a good, you know, a nice looking restoration that is on the enamel, but sealed very well at the gum line. And that's what we're going for. So again, we want to polish them and make them um, almost imperceivable. Gyamers release different ions, including fluoride. And one of the things about today's new materials is that they're rechargeable. So once they release fluoride, can you put fluoride back in them and have them re-release? And the answer is yes. So often with these patients, especially patients uh, that are um, complain of dry mouth or have Chemothera chemotherapy or radiation, a lack of saliva, or, or recurrent decay, rampant decay, abfraction lesions, root sensitivity, those kinds of things. Tray therapy is underutilized in dentistry. And a big advantage of the gyma restorations is that they can recharge with fluoride and then re-release to keep that um, benefit to the oral environment going. Um, when, when you do air abrasion, there's a bunch of different units on the market. A lot of you don't do air abrasion because of the mess. Well, it's been a long time now, but com some companies like Danville, um, you can squirt the, you can spray out the aluminum oxide along with water to get rid of that cloud of dust. So you don't have to have dust flying all over the office. I mean, unless you really like that. Um, there's all kinds of ways to do it today where water's involved. There are many different machines on the market. You can spend a lot of money if you want to even on some of these fancy things like this one. Um, but don't, I'm not ready. I don't see the advantage in spending that much money to be honest with you. So one of the smaller units that just has aluminum oxide, 50 micron, 27 micron, 28 micron and water at the same time can help you a lot. Again, the advantages of the gyamer materials are rechargeable and we can reduce the bacteria that cause irritation to the gum tissue. So again, with 100% gyamer restorations, these are done with flowable and with a gyamer um, hybrid. 
Um, it gives us the ability to do therapy instead of just plugging holes. It's a different way of looking at things. Um, so anyway, let's go over a couple more cases real quick and then let's start playing with stuff. Fluoride release is, it makes us feel good. We like it. So the ionic release is a good thing. Here's a case, check it out. Young patient, had fraction lesions. Look, the other teeth look good, but those bicuspids, what happened there? Okay, it's occlusal related and doing occlusal guards and building up composites on the cuspids to get a, get a patient into cuspid rise is a very important thing. The three pillars of occlusion, simultaneous centric contact, anterior disclusion, disclusion and cuspid rise. So those three things are hard to argue with. Um, so if you start with those basics, that's a good place to start. So in these abfraction areas, just understand that there's other components involved. And I think that you should be aware that we at least need to consider them. Irregular bevel, I use a finishing diamond for that or my air abrasion. Do you have to drill? You don't. You can do that with air abrasion. You can create a nice irregular bevel on the enamel, two or three millimeters long, irregular depths, irregular finish lines, so that the reason for irregular bevels is it breaks up the light better so you won't see your margin. So if you go to get your accreditation, the cosmetic dentistry boards, different ones, the reason that dentists fail direct composites often is that they can see the margin. You can see where your filling meets up with the tooth. One of the ways to get rid of that margin or make it indistinguishable is the way you bevel so that your material goes into the tooth at different angles, different depths, so that it breaks up the light. And nevertheless, a regular bevel, air braid until the root surface looks frosty. Second choice would be um, a laser or a round burr um, or a pumice. The reason that those are compromises is because the air abrasion is a very simple, very fast way, just a few seconds per tooth to make the tooth surface look frosty without using etch. And that's what they look like right out, right after um, the, the uh, air abrasion. Irregular bevel, your air braid, don't forget your isolation. And then this is the second layer we're putting on there after we sealed the gingival part. The second bicuspid there has that first layer on it and it was cured. Now on the first bicuspid, we're adding a, the second layer, all injectable flowable. So to give you an idea, again, that second bicuspid, we've got our first layer on there. You can see it's very thin. It doesn't near fill up the restoration, but it was cured well. And then the second, the first bicuspid, um, has the second layer on there. Maybe we added a third layer, I don't know, but that's what they look like. And that's kind of the sequence that we do. And we seal up or put it on the enamel um, at the end. And the reason is we're trying to control our polymerization shrinkage stresses. And then we're gonna polish and shape and do your thing, whatever your thing is. So again, finally, we're getting some warm weather here. And that's Bentley again, the boy who barked while ago. So I'll take his treat away from him later for barking. I told him I was doing a webinar. He was supposed to be quiet, but there he, he's got a mind of his own. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, can you get away with not drilling? No, not, not always, see, because abfractions often have disease associated with them like decay. And so you have to drill when you have to drill. So getting rid of decay is one of our primary goals as a dentist. And so we'll use a very conservative technique with a number two round burr. And so that we don't drill too much away, we use caries indicator. This caries indicator is red. I prefer the green stuff because I can see it better. And when we use caries indicator, it makes us look and evaluate, but it's all, it also tells us when to stop drilling. So like Lou Graham from Catapult says all the time, how do you know when to stop drilling? Well, we all stop at different places. We all prep differently. We're, some of us are a lot more aggressive than others. We don't have a lot of science behind it, but caries indicator is one of the ways that we can help deal with that. Remember curricular leakage and time. So the longer that we, it, the longer it takes us to place the filling material and cure it, the longer it takes to place the filling material and cure it after we've etched our bonding agents and all that stuff, the more gap in time there, the more chance we have a contamination curricular leakage. Always think about the clear fluid coming out of the gums being a potential contaminant of your gingival margin. 
So you could use a cord, you could use laser, you could use some sort of retraction. Um, you could even use retraction paste. You could use um, a matrix to prevent that curricular leakage from getting on the gums. Irregular bevel, selective etch, rinse, leave the tooth moist, bonding agent, cure. Your first layer of flowable goes at the gum line, cure that well, and then build up the rest of your restoration, even if you used a packable hybrid. Remember, the reason that we use a, an injectable hybrid is because, it's first of all, it's easier, less chance of voids within the restoration, and it polishes as well as the other composites you use, and we maintain some flexure after curing. You can shape it up with a finishing burr. Um, you can do all of it with discs, as we're going to do in just a few minutes. We just want the restoration to blend into the tooth very well. Again, the bevel is very, very important, and how you prepare the dent and surface is very important as well. So all these done with just giant reflowables, all of them. Okay, so some of you have requested your kit, and um, it says supplies are limited. Well, I don't even know what that means. I mean, they're still making this stuff, I assume, right? So, uh, but anyway, if you didn't request it before the deadline, no worries, no worries. A kit is being mailed to all of you. If you're in the continental United States, the kit includes these things on the screen. And so um, let's play. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna switch over to the visualizer. These are the things that's in your kit. And so when you get your kit, you're gonna see some Flow Plus. And um, the first thing that I do is I play with it. And so I'll take my fingernail on my crack finger and I squirt some out and I just play with it. And that's what you should do too. This is the red stuff, right? The stuff that doesn't slump, notice it's not slumping. Now you play with that yourself and figure that out, all right? Don't look at my fingers, they're cracked. Maybe I should put some gloves on. Um, the rest of the stuff in your kit, you get a tooth. This is a real tooth from one of my patients that we extracted. I sterilized it for you, something like that. Some beauty bond, some little polishing thingies, some little tips for your um, flowable. Now, some of you dentists out there, um, I know you have wonderful staff. And for me, I could never do anything without the staff. This little tip thingy goes on the end of the flowable tube. I'm just pointing that out to you because some of these things I don't know until my assistant shows me how to do it. So again, ask an assistant if you don't know. And then of course the, the super snaps are little polishing things. There are regular sized ones and miniature ones. And which ones you use is up to you. Notice a couple of things about these. There's no ring, there's no hole in the middle with a metal grommet like some of the um, manufacturers use. So there's nothing to scratch up your restoration with. And all of them polish from the front and the back side. So you don't have to flip, the, take it off and flip it over to polish, um, except for the black one. The black one only polishes or shapes from the outside. The black one is very coarse, very abrasive. And then it goes purple, then green, and then red. Okay, the other cool thing about these is, wow, where's my mandrel? I lost my mandrel. Oh, you know what I'm saying? Is that you can't find your mandrels, right? So a lot of, the, a lot of times, instead of looking for them, these packages come with a mandrel and the mandrel's in there already. So you don't even have to look for it. So whenever we do composites, the assistant has a little pack out and it has all the stuff in it already. You can get the micro ones or the regular size ones. Um, and then you're ready to go. Now, the first thing that I'm gonna have you do, let's get rid of this. First of all, I wanna make sure that we're all on the same page here. If you are sad because you don't have a kit, it's coming, okay? So make sure that uh, when you get it, start playing with your stuff. Here's a tooth to practice with, and you'll, you'll be caught up with all of us. Oh, but don't forget. It's coming. Oh, some of you who got your kits already, um, I hope you didn't throw the box away. It comes in a nice box. And there's some prizes I hear, prizes in some of these kits. Now look through your kit very well. Here, here's one of the prizes one of you have in your kit. It's one of these, okay? Um, it's taped to the inside of the box. You have to look in little, look in the corners and stuff because there might be some something in there. Here's another one that some of you might have in there, maybe. I'm, well, I'm not sure about that. I also hear that um, 
another attendance prize for tonight. If you do a lot of engine painting, we have a high heat Rust-Oleum engine paint in there that's in some of the boxes, I think. Um, I even heard that, especially to the Shofu employees, there's a chance in one of the boxes you might have the keys to a Porsche. Okay, I'm just saying. So very important that you get the kit because it's got a lot of good stuff in it. Here's our victim for tonight. Um, and again, it's kind of hard to see with the visualizer. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna try to zoom in in a minute. Um, and we're gonna, I wanna do this without making you too dizzy and I don't want it to look too grainy. I'm just gonna go a little tiny bit there. Now you have a class five lesion, a, an ab fraction lesion on this. And um, remember also that the first thing you do when a patient walks into the office is you put a bib on it. So I've got a little bib to put on the patient. Here's the bib, okay, to protect it. Okay, so let's forget all that. So the first thing I want you to do is to grab your tooth and grab your drill, because I assume you don't have air abrasion with you right now, and we're gonna place an irregular bevel. And the angle for the bevel is like this with a diamond. You could use a carbide as well. The idea is have irregularity. What do I mean by that? What I did is I did one for you earlier and I'm gonna give you an idea what the bevel looks like. So here comes, here comes the bevel. So when we do a bevel, it's irregularly shaped. It is in different angles, different ends in different places. I colored with a pencil where I have my bevel. Do you see that it goes to different heights? It goes to different areas. What you're doing with the bevel is increasing the surface area of the best bond in the history of the dentistry. It is very important for bonding on anterior teeth if you want good aesthetics and an increased in durability is to grab as much surface area of the enamel as possible. That's still the best bond long-term in the history of dentistry. That bond is irregular. If I were to do a, a little bit more of a demonstration, and I know you know this already, most of your bonds, if I was to you do that with a piece of wood, most of your bonds look like this 45 degree angle that I put on this wood, or excuse me, most of your bevels. That bevel is good. I mean, that's nice. But if you could imagine if I was trying to grab onto this piece of wood or a tooth, would I be able to grab onto that better or this better? This gives you an idea of how we do our bevels on a tooth. So take your diamond right now and do that bevel. I'm not gonna start my drill up because it's very obnoxiously loud on these webinars, but I'm gonna give you a chance to do that. So again, irregular bevels, it gets deeper as we move towards the abfraction area and it gets shallower as we go up the enamel towards the tip of the tooth. And so different, degrees of, of depth. Again, this is minor, it's way less than a half a millimeter. We scratch these teeth. And what we're looking for is something to break up the light. Whenever we look straight down at a tooth, if you do a 45 degree angle, the light goes through the material that you placed and it hits the tooth and it creates a white line or a demarcation between the filling material and the tooth. That irregular bevel is what helps prevent that. Again, if you do aesthetic boards um, in one of the organizations, they will um, fail you if they can see the margin. And so again, if you want to, it takes no more time to do that. It's just a little bit of, just a little bit of thinking about how you're going to place your bevel and why you're doing it. Two reasons, again, to hide that margin. Number two, to increase the surface area of the best bond in the history of dentistry long-term, and that's to enamel. Okay, next. After you're done with that, you rinse your tooth off. Um, again, that bevel should look something like that, however you do it. It's hard for me to zoom in closer than that without making you dizzy. Just a little bit of scratch in there to different depths. Okay, that's done. Now, in the real world right now, what I would do is I would place a little bit of etch just on the, um, on the enamel. And so just to do selective etched right on the enamel and that's it. And then rinse that off, leave the tooth moist. Then we're gonna take our flowable composite and we're gonna place it just at the gingival area right here. And let me squirt some on there and I'm gonna move my hand to get better lighting for you. And I'm just gonna cover that margin. Now with the red stuff, you're gonna notice wherever you stop and lift up, there might be a little tail of that material. You see it sticking up there? 
Okay. The reason I tell you that is the red material is no flow and it will do that because it's not going anywhere. The blue material, if I was using it, the low flow material, a little less viscous, it will self level. If you wait just a couple of seconds, then cure it, then you won't see that little tail. So the blue stuff to me, um, I prefer in some of these situations or other practitioners, I'm going to cure it. Oh, that looks cool. And now I'm ready for the next layer. And what I'm going to do is take my flowable. And in this second layer, what we're going to do is make sure that we have covered all of the dentin. Make sure that if you didn't get it in the first layer, you've covered it all and everything up to two millimeters or so away from the surface. So with this restoration, you could probably do it in two layers, but probably in my case, I'm gonna do it in three. So I'm gonna fill up and cover that den. Remember, every time you lift up your flowable, just like with a regular composite, you have the chance of getting air. So every time you lift up and replace it, you got to have a chance for more air. And air in the wrong place can lead to sensitivity, but certainly to weaken your restoration. So get your flowable on the tooth, Press, squirt, lift it up when you're done, not until, and then cure. When you cure this time, now you've sealed up all your dentin, all your cementum. We've cured it well. We've handled our polymerization shrinkage in that area. We've handled that. Now, all we have to do is complete everything. We're gonna add the rest of our material on the surface here. And Again, put your flowable tip on there, put it on there, start moving it. The less movement without lifting it up, the better, less chance of air getting trapped in there. Okay, we're gonna cover everything this time, a little extra, I'm gonna go past my bevel and I'm gonna polish back to my bevel. Okay, and then like here again, Okay, and then shape. Now, you know what? We did forget a step, and that is the bonding agent. Didn't we forget that? Yeah, I forgot bonding agent. Sorry about that. Long day. So anyway, after our etch, we rinse off, we place our bonding agent, and that's Beauty Bond. Again, it tells you in the directions that this bonds to non, to, it bonds to enamel. It does. It's, it's acidic. We can put it on. It becomes more neutral after you air thin it and light cure it. But it's still better if you can etch the enamel first, especially on uncut enamel areas before you place it. Okay, sorry about that. When you are done, light cure it very well. Remember that you can't over cure a composite. You can under cure a composite. And remember too that a under cured composite, especially on the dentin can lead to sensitivity. Uncured resin is a pulpal irritant. And so we don't want that, right? So we wanna make sure that we have cured it very well. Now, after you cure, you've got some choices in how to shape these. My preference in the real world is to use a finishing diamond with water to do my initial prepping. Finishing diamonds to me work very well. But for a lot of you, you don't like those skinny, uh, finishing diamonds. And so um, a disc is fine. Remember that discs have to be safe. I want you to know this too, just in case you were ever asked this on a quiz or something. When your disc spins, it turns, right? Do we want it to turn from the composite towards the tooth? Or do we want it spinning from the tooth onto the composite? Now, a lot of you know the answer to that. I know you do. Think about that for a second if you don't. You're gonna do your initial shaping. The black is the first. It is very uh, abrasive, so black. When you do the black one, it has to be with very light pressure. And many times I don't need to use the black one, to be honest with you. It is very abrasive. It only has abrasives on the one side. So when you use the black one, be careful. Also notice that the black one the abrasives on the outside, none on the inside. This is mylar. These are uh, um, oxides stuck to mylar. And when you go, you can grind too much and all the oxides are gone, then you're just left with mylar. My point behind that is this. These are very durable. They last very, very well, as well as anything you use. Um, all I'm saying is 
um, is that you, um, light pressure is all you need, okay? Just light pressure. We don't wanna build up heat or anything. We want the disc spinning from the restoration towards the tooth. So as we polish and shape, we wanna make sure that our disc is spinning so that it goes from the restoration onto the tooth. It spins this way as it turns. When we touch it, we want it spinning towards the tooth. Now, because of the angle of the patient, sometimes I have to turn my slow speed on reverse to make sure it's spinning from the restoration to the tooth. Why is that? If it turns and it pushes against the restoration, we have a chance of being a little too aggressive to the edge of the restoration, causing it to sometimes do little micro chipping. And that can create that white line you see between the tooth and the restoration. Those white lines that you see between your composites and your tooth are caused often by neglect. And the neglect I'm talking about is overheating the tooth while you're polishing or shaping. Number two, too aggressive as you polish or shape. Um, and then poor bonding could be another one. But all I'm saying is, is to make it spin from the restoration to the tooth, go slow, and remember there's heat involved. I keep my discs wet when I polish them. The reason I do that is number one, to keep heat down, and number two, to help wash the particles away so that my discs stay working better. In other words, I'm kind of flushing things away. So if I'm polishing a large composite, not this small one, a large composite, my assistant will often drip water on it while I'm polishing, or better yet, I let them do it. Um, they're better than me, but it regardless, polish and shape. So again, black, purple, green, and then red. There's large ones and small ones. You can play with them. I use the large ones 99% of the time, but these small ones come in handy, especially if there's a surgical case or a very small restoration near the gum line. And I certainly don't want to cut the gums, right? So the large ones I find a little bit more flexible. And it seems to me that I can control them better. Now you probably have better hands than me and you're probably better with the small ones. So again, once you get to the red one, what you're gonna notice is that the surface is gonna get very, very shiny and it starts shining up. In fact, in this case, we can make the, we can make the restoration look shinier than that tooth is. Now the tooth itself is plastic and it doesn't shine up too well. Okay, and so what I'm saying is, is when you shine these up, you're gonna notice how well these flexible discs work and how well they shine. And you'll see that Flow Plus X shines as well as most of the universal composites you use. They are, it is terrific at holding a shine and keeping it that way for many years after you use it, after you shine it up. So it maintains that shine, I'm sorry, trouble focusing. I'm gonna move my hand out of the way and let you kind of see there. So again, we want that surface to be shiny. So kind of like to, just to go over things again, as we start, I'm gonna move this a little bit. We're gonna have a restoration. We're going to do as little grinding and drilling as possible. We're going to do an irregular bevel and the bevel is to break up the light and increase the surface area on the tooth. We want to air abrade the root surface or do as little tooth reduction as possible. Um, uh, laser a round burr on a slow speed just to break that surface tension and get rid of the contaminants on the surface. Then we're going to do selective etch and rinse and then bonding agent. Air thin the bonding agent to get rid of the solvents. And then light cure. Then we are going to place our first layer of flowable at the gum line and light cure it well. Then we're gonna place flowable to cover the dentin if we haven't already. And then finally to the enamel and light cure them between each layer. Remember, you can't over cure a composite. You can certainly overheat a tooth, but what we wanna do is control that heat and go incrementally in layers and then polish well. All those things will lead to very good clinical success for you. And um, that will make happy patients and a happy doctor and all that. Now I want you to notice too, the flowable is somewhat transparent, just a little bit. And 
what that means is, is that sometimes you can see through it a little bit. That is an advantage in the mouth. You get that chameleon type effect, if you will, and that it, it takes up some of the colors from the surrounding enamel and dentin. Now, this comes in many different shades. In fact, we use these as tints, tints within our anterior composites that we're trying to do a highly aesthetic job with. They make a white one that's very white, and I use that for check lines. And then they make darker colors as well with less value that we use for characterization within our composites. They even make an incisal um, composite that is clearish, if you will. And uh, while you're polishing and shaping and playing with that, I'm going to look at some questions here before we quit here. Um, yes. Question about air abrasion always is, do you um, uh, sandblast everything? The enamel, the margins, all of the dentin cement, and the answer is yes, yes, and yes. We air abrade everything, including that cementum margin. Now remember, the air pressure that you use and the distance away from the tooth obviously is a factor in all this, right? So you're gonna practice a little bit with an air abrasion and the way to do that is with a real extracted tooth and to see how powerful your, your unit is, how much pressure you have and how far of a way, away from the tooth. For me, normally it's about an inch or so away from the tooth and I go psh, 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 just a little blast at a time to help control um, where I'm blasting to. We don't wanna sandblast the margins away. And it doesn't blast dentin or cementum away as much as it does enamel because it's a lot, enamel is a lot harder. And so when you air abrade an enamel, it goes away a little faster. So just, just saying, as you, if you use it for a, um, uh, to do your bevel, then be careful with your um, air abrasion. You think you're being conservative. Perhaps you're, you are, hopefully, but sometimes you can go a little bit overboard and air abrade too much enamel away. Retraction paste. Okay. Um, yes, retraction paste, if you use that to control curricular leakage, you have to put it on the tooth before you start, let it set for several minutes, rinse it off, and then prepare your dentin because all of the retraction paste leave a small film on the surface. And so when you leave a small film on the surface, you have to deal with that and get rid of that. And so if you use retraction paste, put it on the curricular leakage first, it will help stop bleeding and curricular leakage, then rinse it off and then do your work. All right. Um, Activa Presto is a good material. It is another regenerative type material. You will have better efficiency by using an injectable hybrid like, like the flow we talked about. Uh, can super snaps be reused? No. Don't do them, don't, don't autoclave them. They're very inexpensive, a package of, in fact, you can buy them in bulk. If you just find yourself just using the say green and red after your finishing burr, which is very plausible, then you can buy in bulk, just buy the red and buy the green and just toss them each time. Do you have to use the pack with the disposable mandrel? You don't, you can use a regular mandrel if you want. Um, so that's up to you. Depends on if you lose things as much as I do. What kind of products recharge the fluoride ions in, in these types of materials? Um, almost any kind of fluoride does. It, a regular fluoride, Henry Schein fluoride or from Patterson or whoever you get your fluoride from, um, gel cam, um, Prevident, and then the paste that we use the most are like Remin Pro from Vogo um, or MI Paste from GC. Those release, those have fluoride in them and they recharge the restorations but even fluoride from water or from toothpaste can help recharge them as well. Um, shrinkage is over 3%, but remember we're controlling the shrinkage stresses by doing it in layers and being strategic with our layering. And that is to place it at the gingival margin, which matters the most first, then building up in increments from there. Generally speaking on these, I, build, I do the cementum margin, the entire cementum or dentin margin, then I cover, and I cover the entire dentin in about a half a millimeter layer as my first layer. So I've covered all the dentin cementum in the first layer, about a half millimeter thick. Then I build up incrementally. How do you mask discolored dentin? You mask discolored dentin by using more opaque um, flowable composites. When you look at the 
the flowable, um, the flow plus X colors and stuff, you'll see some that are opaque. Look at that and you can help block colors with those. Do I use rubber dams? The answer is yes and no. Generally speaking for class five lesions, I don't. I use retractors. Um, when we do a rubber dam, can you tuck the rubber dam into the sulcus? Are you good enough with your rubber damming to do that? And the answer is for me, no. So I use retractors um, and then like photographic retractors that hold themselves, if you will, um, uh, or an optrogate from, um, oh, well, I'm drawing a blank, alternate, um, those kinds of retractors. And then um, again, be cognizant of the fact that gingival leaks. And so those are all great questions. Do I ever use glaze? Um, I've used glaze lots of times. It doesn't photograph well. So in the publishing teaching world, um, glazed restorations don't photograph well, they're too shiny. In your world, in the real world, in, in my world as well, most of the time, um, a glaze helps seal those imperfections on the surface and it can lead to a better looking restoration. But I will say that if you're gonna use an injectable hybrid, which has um, very few voids in the tube from Shofu, very few voids, and you don't keep lifting your tip off the tooth as you do each layer, voids won't be an issue for you anyway. So you don't really need to use the glaze. However, glazing, no problem. Thank you all for listening and for being a great audience. And I really appreciate your time and the effort that you show to uh, your commitment to dentistry, um, because when you do that, it makes me happy. And I wanna make sure that um, you guys, you gals, um, have a great, great career and do every restoration as if it's your last, um, as good as you can, given that circumstance, that patient um, and all. Have a good evening and thank you very much. Stay safe out there and um, I'll see you down the road.